Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series, the Power Series, uh, and thank you for joining us. Today, we'll be discussing the power of digital communities with three amazing guests. Uh, so, the founder of the digital platform, What We See, Nisana Riman, uh, the technology entrepreneur, Tom Adeyula, and the founder of MacPherson Strategies, uh, Susan MacPherson. The talk will be moderated by um, our CEO, uh, Diana Verdeneto, and uh, you can submit your questions anytime during this webinar. Uh, our panel will answer them at the end. Uh, over to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Claudia, and good afternoon, everybody. This has become my favorite day to connect with, with people that I haven't seen for a while. So uh, it's great. It's my absolute honor to have you here today. And uh, three incredible entrepreneurs, actually. That is the common, the commonality of you three. And the fact that independently, you have built incredibly powerful communities. So, you know, today, um, everybody's seeking these magic recipes of, you know, how to keep their companies relevant in these, you know, crazy times that we're living in. And the power of communities and the power of digital communities has become even more important than ever before. And there is a subtle difference between online communities and social media based communities. And I'd like to kick it off with uh, Tom, actually. I mean, and I start with you and then please build in um, for everybody else. But what is the difference between, you know, social media based communities and online communities? So the way I like to think about it is that from for an online community, it's it's a, a a gathering together of people with shared interests or shared goals whereas i often feel that social media based communities you're there almost by accident it's very passive and it's about wasting time whereas an online community has a greater purpose around it and a, and a sense of why you are there together so you are coming together for a particular reason and to achieve a certain goal mm -hmm. but you know an online community can use social media to branch out right yeah yes yes absolutely but there's some but there's something that's active about it so yeah. you can use many different tools to come together but i think often a lot of uh, certainly how you know facebook started and 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 pushed on from there a lot of it is just about this a place to go to waste time <laughs> so it was the monetization of dead time somebody once told me that spending an hour on instagram is like eating a bag of cheetos there's absolutely no nutritional value. You don't get full. <laughs> you don't feel enriched. <laughs> I don't know if you have Cheetos in, in London, but we do here in the States. A, a good example of, um, of uh, an online community is I'm a dog owner. Uh, I have a Hungarian Vishla. And when we first got my boy Nelson, we were a little bit lost at sea because they're quite specific breed. So we found a couple of Hungarian Vizsla groups on Facebook and very focused, as you said, Tom, with people all with the same interests. And it was, it was, it was amazing for us because suddenly we weren't alone. And that's what I call a very, a, a very real online community that was built on Facebook, which is actually the opposite to what people now think of Facebook as. So it depends what you're looking for. And again, the, the word that's gonna come up a lot for me in this conversation is curation. You yeah. know, we, we curated that experience for ourselves and found that within Facebook, which is usually not what people, again, see Facebook as. No, of course. I don't know who has the a phone. Uh, I'm not in mute, but if you can put it on mute, it would be amazing, thank you. Um, the question I wanted to ask, I mean, Misa, you have built, you know, what we've seen is an incredible community and we just were talking a little bit about uh, what is it based offline. Um, I'd love to, i love you to share how that started and how it's growing. And also, um, you know, you are uh, one of the most incredible photographers, like portrait photographers, um, you know, of our time, really. Oh, uh, thank you. you Goodness. You truly, I mean, when people know your work, it's like, who is this guy? I mean, you have done, you know, uh, royal engagements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I like to talk about like what we've seen as a platform, and also the power of art uh, as a community, or, or the power of, of photography as a communication tool, and, and building those visual communities. Because you know, you that that also is a kind of a common language to build commonality. Yeah, and 
thank you. And I think the, the first thing is, is the internet is, is um, a gift and a curse. And we all know the curse side of it because, you know, everyone complains about uh, the negative side of, of, of the information superhighway. But I'm going to talk about the gift of the internet, which has allowed me to be the person I am today. Firstly, I'm, I'm very dyslexic um, to the point where I, I can barely type an email that makes sense without using apps like Grammarly that just help me sort out, you know, um, the look of, of what I'm trying to say. So as a young person, I've, I struggled a lot in the classroom. It wasn't really designed for how my mind is wired. And when this thing called the internet found me in the, in the, in the, in the late 90s, I was able to consume information at this, the, the, the frequency that I, I'm designed for. So that's the first gift. And then it allowed me to, I, I would describe it as an endless library. Imagine walking into an endless library um, of information that you didn't need to ask anyone and no one judged you for what you were looking to learn. And through that, I became this digital hoarder. So this person that, oh, if I saw this song or this picture or this film, I would want to share it with as many people as possible. I was doing that in the physical realm with my collection of good friends, but the internet, specifically Facebook in the early days, allowed me to reach hundreds and then it became thousands and then it became millions of people. And the one thing we had in common was a lot of these people didn't know where to look um, for interesting content. You know, growing up um, in the 80s, um, you would have four or five TV channels and all of the curation was done by other gatekeepers. Now, the problem and the gift of the internet we know today is that there are no gatekeepers. So, you know, there are millions of channels that uh, for many people, it, 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 they drown in the noise of the internet. So I wanted to build a platform that was on all the, the kind of uh, devices that we're used to, consume, to consuming media with, but that was heavily curated. So you would know that if you go onto what we see, the songs would have been picked by a human. So we call our business a mindful media company and the human algorithm. So we do not publish any content because we think it's gonna do well. We publish it because our team have been moved by it. Whether it gets one like or a million likes doesn't matter to me. If, if our team like it and it has moved their emotional engine, then that's good enough to put out into the universe. And I think that authenticity is the reason we grew from uh, one Facebook page to 28 pages on Instagram, Facebook, and the net, reaching over 1.5 billion people in three years. Um, this was all done organically as well, using Instagram and Facebook and uh, the the viral growth of content it's become a lot harder now but in three years ago i could post a, a story that had moved me and it could reach literally 50 million people facebook has realized that that wasn't necessarily good for their <laughs> their business model and they've reduced organic reach um even for people uh like our good selves if you're a brand and this is one thing i wanted to touch on it's, there's almost zero organic reach. So if you go onto the Coca-Cola page, there's a great example. Coca-Cola has probably 100 million followers. And if you just scroll down, you will see that it gets one like or two likes on a post. And that's, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, how can a page be that big and have such little organic reach? And the reality is, is that everyone knows who Coke is and Coke has a very big advertising budget. And Facebook is well aware of that. So if they want to reach people, they have to pay for it. That's just the reality of the age that we're in, which means that it is not a democracy to have organic reach anymore, which, which I think is a very concerning thing. So let me just repeat that. Major brands, huge brands, do not have the reach that is reflective of the following that they have, which I think is actually unfair. Yeah, I mean, I want to touch about the power of Facebook um, and they have been very quiet uh, in this uh, pandemic. Um, so it's also about how millions are coping with the crisis and how do you think they're contributing, how Facebook is contributed to this in terms of good content, bad content, pushing content. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it 
quite a lot and obviously people still have it as a destination point and we talked about the power of social media pre-corona yeah. and this was about mental health so do you think that we have advanced in any way do you think it's better do you think that they're playing a role um susan tom what, what are your thoughts on this well it <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with Facebook. I mean, I think we, we all do to a certain extent. Um, you know, the good, the good part about it, especially right now, is the ability to stay in touch and also find people. Um, the Wall Street Journal yesterday had an article that was saying that in this time of being disconnected, old friends are finding each other from, you know, millions of miles away, obviously using Facebook and probably LinkedIn. And I think that that can be it, it, it in this odd time very um, soothing and and almost medicinal right I mean because you we're craving some sort of content um, you know the, and I again can only speak from from the American perspective here but you know we there's been over the last couple of years a lot of disinformation misinformation that has been allowed to remain on the facebook platform even when we know it was it was false um and i think that that has done some irreprehensible damage uh, and and damage which may be you know impossible to put back in the box um so you know i see i see both sides um, you're right, they have, you know, you don't see a lot of commentary coming out from Mark and from Cheryl and, and the leadership at Facebook, but I, um, I do know what they are trying to do is sit back, not sit back, but allow brands, allow companies, allow uh, government officials to use it as their sounding boards, as opposed to taking um, an initiative. I mean, I, I, I think yeah, absolutely true. I mean, I think every, everything around why they're quiet now is quite political. So I think you could look at this as a, a pre-2016 Facebook and a post-2016 Facebook. Uh, pre-2016, they pretty much were absorbed in, in this, you know, this notion of the Pollyanna assumption, which was that everything about Facebook was good. It was going to take society towards this utopian dream. Everyone would be able to to find each other you were your real self and therefore that would civilize communities so so they spent a lot of time talking themselves up during things like the arab spring they were they were doing a lot of active you know additional features for how people could get could get in touch and they were doing lots of pr and press at that time then you have 2016 um uh you know trump coming to power everything around you know russian disinformation cambridge analytica so on and so forth and huge missteps in how they they dealt with that because they just could not believe that facebook could be used for ill as well as for good it could it's it's all parts of society right so it, it it's it's a massive amplification of every type of message you want to give because i think with a platform like that you have free access and distribution you can make a message you can uh, put something out there and you can reach a lot of people quickly so that's great when it's good but when it's bad that's you know really difficult and so over the last few years you've seen facebook try to be very humble they've they've taken on a lot of lobbyists from a political perspective including our our former deputy prime minister nick clegg <laughs> yeah. um and they've had to employ an army of people. So I, I remember thinking it was interesting that Facebook could be a billion plus dollar company with 2000 people. And you, it, it sort of has seemed to go, have gone by a factor of 10 each time. So before that you needed 20,000 and you needed 200,000. And then after Facebook with Instagram, et cetera, you needed 10 people. Um, and they only needed 2000 people until they realized that there was all this bad stuff that could happen on their platform. And then they needed to hire thousands and thousands and thousands of people to, to try and take the disinformation and the bad content off the platform whilst at the same time trying to think, how can they solve this algorithmically? So I think because they've been doing that and because they've made missteps in the past, I think that's probably been driving why they haven't really put their heads above the parapet during this crisis when, Interestingly, I think because they are a platform, a social platform where yeah, the whole world is at home, they, <laughs> they are connecting people. I would have expected them to have been quite vocal and quite forth, at the forefront of introducing new features and new ways for people mm. to get in touch. And, but they haven't. 
I, I found that really interesting. I think that all stems back to the 2016 um, Cambridge Analytica, et cetera, mm. nightmare that they, they went well, through. I'm, I'm going to just add something to that. I mean, I, I personally run um, over a dozen Facebook pages. And I think when we talk about Facebook, we need to talk about what Facebook owns. So WhatsApp, <laughs> uh, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you look at the bird's eye view, um, I'm not going to defend Facebook, but I'm going to say this. Um, the COVID updates that are automatically in the Facebook app, that have been sent out on WhatsApp, that have been used by the World Health Organization on WhatsApp, um, and that are being blasted out on Instagram. That's really useful. And that's, that's not any genius thing that Facebook has done. It's because they have scale, right? And that kind of scale, there is no company on earth that can reach as many people in one go. Uh, if you just think about the, re the digital real estate of Instagram, WhatsApp, and, and Facebook is out outrageous. So that's a good thing. Um, live streaming has become a mainstay. I mean, look at what we're doing right now, right? Um, so, you know, house party, Zoom, and of course, Facebook Live, Instagram Live has become very powerful. And I would say that it has been helpful for people's mental health issues to be able to, to watch DJ, you know, D-Nice go, go on Instagram and have the whole world watching him. That's a good thing. So that's, that's a gift of what Facebook is. What is a problem is that imagine being a headmaster of a school with over 2 billion people that completely reflects the mirror of mankind with all our, 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 our failings. And that's where you can get issues with Facebook. One of our pages is always getting um, a lot of people comment about the fact that coronavirus isn't real. And we get this all the time. We get sent these links and Facebook, pulls them down, we, we will send um, the post to Facebook, but they can never act fast enough. And I think this is what Tom was talking about. It sounds weird to say that they don't have the resources, but if you look at the scale of the problem, how many people are posting posts about 5G being the cause of coronavirus, or that it was created by whatever government, you know, we don't need to get into all that, and that's being shared by someone, and we, they don't have the um, good enough AI to pick this up every microsecond before yeah. it becomes a viral thing. And that, that's, that's the issue. And I'm not defending Facebook, but the issue is they are almost too big to be able to police themselves at the rate that we need. Yeah, and it, this takes us to a kind of a tangible, I guess, bring it back to where we are, um, which Corona is really real. <laughs> and we are here for at least another three weeks, all of us. And people not, I mean, Susan, I don't know how long you've got, I mean, anything could happen in the US, but I guess the average country has for another two, three weeks of, of lockdown uh, or slowly coming out of it. It will be much longer here. You at least, so. oh yeah, in New York Let's City. Let's not go into the US and Corona. It's just not worth it. I don't have enough. Uh, I don't have a, a glass of vodka. I've got a cup of tea. So <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> um, two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about. Let's talk about communities. Let's talk about how can we brands, small businesses, big businesses, um, right now can build and leverage digital communities, using uh, probably a myriad of different resources, using social uh, or not. And each one of you have done that in your own capacity. So um, which advice uh, or tips can you give uh, to small and big businesses, all sizes, to really kind of build digital communities? Because let's face it, even if you are one of the most powerful brands, digital is still in its infancy. And I think we can now, after what happens uh, now, we have actually discovered that digital is still in its infancy. So you guys are pioneers on this. Which tips can you give us uh, into how to build digital communities? Um, I would start with knowing who your audience is and knowing who you want to communicate with and what are the best means to communicate with them or to them. Um, I am finding the actual use of the old telephone is making a comeback. Even among youth that 
you know, don't even realize that their smartphone can like dial a number and you can actually, you know, because they're so used to FaceTime or, you know, using WhatsApp or texting. So, um, and I digress, but I think it's really understanding who your audience is and, and figuring out what are the means to stay in good contact with them. And also, I, my company, which I founded seven years ago, we have been remote since the beginning. Um, and we're still the same team. And the team loves each other, even though we physically only see each other, you know, every few weeks. And our secret is this notion of staying together and, and over communicating almost. So um, right now, and again, in this crazy time, if, if it is brand authentic, um, I recommend that brand leaders actually over communicate both to their internal audiences and their external audiences. I mean, not with meaningless but actual, you know, interesting, sorry, <laughs> um, but interesting, meaningful connections, but, and, and most importantly, leading with empathy and compassion, uh, that, 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 this is the time for that. So I, I want to give the floor over to my two brilliant um, co-hosts. Yeah, I would just reiterate that, like authentic messaging. So I think you've, you've got to remember, and spend a bit of time thinking about who your audiences are, like dial up hugely on empathy. It's like, what situation are your customers in right now? What, what do they care about? What are the things that they're thinking about? And how do you connect into that in a real and authentic way? Everybody's at home They're you know, they're worried they're, you know, who is your customer? What sort of home do they live in? Like, you know, what's their, the state of their mental health going to be like? Do you have, a role to play in improving their their state of mind and and being able to connect with them if you do then play up on those messages if you don't then i think you have to think about who are the people that you will do and i think it's almost one of those things where it's it's almost extremely dangerous to try to connect to people in an unauthentic way at a time where the message is not going to be received well i think you could do pretty pretty huge damage like if i <laughs> If I just think back to, so I'm a football fan, so I'm a Tottenham football fan. My uh, club was, I think, the second to say they were going to take money from the government and put a whole bunch of their staff on furlough. The fan base reacted terribly to that. And it's taken them a long while. And this is somebody who's utterly ruthless. It took him a long while to understand from his advisors and his team that if he did not reverse that decision, we would deliver long lasting impact to, to the fan base that and they would not be forgiven. So they're, 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 it, you can make really bad judgment calls here and you have to think back down to your, your customers and think what situation are they in and how can I react accordingly? I would agree with everything you've said. Um, I all say when I'm going for brand pitches, um, I'm not interested in selling a product. And they, they sometimes think I'm, I'm crazy. Literally, I'll say that to the brand. I said, the consumer is smart and they're sick and tired of being bombarded with try this, buy that. Everyone has to become a storyteller. I don't care whether you are a, a plumber or a, a, a massive you know, multinational luxury brand. It does not matter. You have to be a storyteller. I also remember almost a decade ago when John Lewis decided to hire Adam and Eve to do its, its um, brand creative. And they, they started basically making short films that have become so successful that many people consider the English Christmas hasn't started until they see a John Lewis advert. I mean, one of the earliest videos was the one uh, with the, 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 the young girl being born and then her going through the cycle of life until she was an older lady with the Billy Joel song playing. Now, no one's flogging a sofa or a mirror or anything. It is a story that we can all find a way of connecting to. And it's, it has been hugely successful. So I think every, everyone that's starting any kind of business has to remember that you have to be a storyteller, a genuine why and what you're about, rather than this is a product and I would like you to buy it. It's that, that, those, that, those, it's over, you know, that kind of TV avid style. For me, I think the consumer doesn't want to see that. If they want to spend money, they will, they, there's so many different ways to get to that wallet than you telling them to spend the money 
And this is a really good time to basically experiment with storytelling because people aren't buying products, right? So if, if, if you're not going out, you're not going to be looking to buy a new dress because you haven't got anything to go out for. So now is a really good time to experiment with how you deliver that storytelling and how you connect with the consumer during this moment so that when the consumer is ready to go out and start spending again, they're going to spend it with you because you've mm -hmm. been with them through the dark times. No. Yeah. I, do, I do, sorry to interrupt, I do agree with you. And I, I wonder, I mean, sometimes um, about how companies spend all this money creating more and more noise. Because when you have the authenticity in your DNA, um, of course, you, the stories are within your communities, within your employees, within your actions. And of course, you have the products, etc. But a lot of the stuff lies in the authenticity of the business and the purpose of the business and so on. And I really do hope that one of the things, or maybe two of the things that come out of these you know, kind of crazy times are first and foremost, we are not consumers. I am not a consumer. I'm so much more than that. I'm a storyteller. Uh, I've got my choices. I've got my opinions and I am a fan of the brand and I really dislike uh, to be just put in the box of being a consumer. I think for the last four weeks, none, nobody has been, I don't think nobody, but a lot of people have not been a consumer. And I think the second point to this is the fact that um, I think hopefully when we come out of this, the whole area of purpose, authenticity, sustainability is not something that it will be compromised because I think we need this so badly in order to actually probably, I think, alter the course of where we're going as a, as a human race. Um, I don't know what your opinion is, but I love your opinion on this and then uh, your wise uh, kind of closing remarks before we jump to Q and A's. Um, I, mean, I, I think, mean, do you want to pick it up actually, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, all I was gonna say is I, I think this period has been quite interesting in, in the sense of it, it's felt like lots of people have been reconnected to their own local communities, like mm -hmm. the sense of like, you know, the, the shops around the corner, how are they doing? How are they suffering through this? How can I support them? How can I make sure I get fruit and veg from somebody you know local and I think th that sense of your neighbor and locality and community and that sort of reconnection has definitely happened or it feels like it's happening in some way because everybody's been restricted to place so therefore your your mind is restricted it's like I, where I live I can sort of just about see and feel what's happening here but I have no idea what's happening in Birmingham. I have no idea what's happening in Doncaster. So almost in some respects, my worldview has shrunk and grown at the same time. So the whole world is in shutdown. So you hear about everything and where it's happening in the world and what are the death rates and mortality rates and it, everything feels so global, but also feels extraordinarily local and small and real and human. So. Um, and, th and what you're saying is reflected very much in the um, resurgence of local news. Um, local news, at least in the United States, has been, you know, local newspapers have disappeared. You know, local broadcasts really just take feeds from the networks and we're seeing a real change. So I think what you're saying is reflective in, in all parts of our society. Um, there's a company called Nextdoor, which is literally neighborhoods connecting and it's just skyrocketing because I think what you said, Tom, is so real. We, we are really curious and, and concerned about our local livelihood and we are stuck in our local livelihood right now. But I, I want to echo what Diana stated about um, I, that I do believe and I agree with you 100% that this is going to make empathy and and, and, um, and purpose even more central than it was before. I mean, we've seen us getting there and certainly positive luxury is, is, is you know, uh, echoing that in everything it does, but th there's no going back. I mean, companies are going to have to put employees first. They're going to have to put the communities they operate in first and foremost. And all of us who consume from these companies and brands are gonna be pushing companies to be that way. Mm. No, I agree. Misan. It's um, 
is a reset for all of us. Um, I don't think anyone was prepared for this, um, including the um, governments uh, that are supposed to look after us, uh, the brands that we thought we knew, and the communities that we live in. All of us were, it was just a, it just hit brick wall, hit, hit, hit us all. And I, in a way, I like the fact that it happened that way because that's when we are forced to really question how we shop, um, how we do business, how we look after our family, um, and also think about um, the mental health implications of all of this as well. Mm -hmm. So many people who um, I always thought were, you know, just doing really well in all aspects of their lives. I've had some incredible um, conversations with over WhatsApp, video, you know, FaceTime, and they're like, look, I'm scared, Nissan. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to say it, but I'm scared of what the future holds. And that is fear for their professional aspirations, fear for their family. And it's that level of fear that brings the importance of empathy. Because the moment I told my friend that I was feeling exactly the same way as him, um, it, it made him realize that this is what everyone is going through. I do not know anyone who is a human being right now that is not having waves of concern, bouts of anxiety. And I think the brand conversation should be that as well, to say, listen, we're, we're all a little bit confused. Let's try and work through this together with whatever means that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's, that's a sea change that is happening is that it's vulnerability isn't just um, something that you read about that other people have. It's invaded all of our homes. It's invaded all of our businesses. And we have to figure out how to, to kind of work through this together. Mm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think oh. the same... Yeah, that vulnerability is key because I think I think we we all thought we were invincible, our economies were invincible, and everything mm -hmm. was endless growth. And suddenly it's like, oh no, we're not. And I I think we can't underestimate the economic impact of this. Is mm -hmm. I mean, is is and is going to be massive, mm -hmm. and that part is still lagging, right? So we haven't seen how you know society is going to react to what in America, 16 million people already unemployed here is going to be like 2 million. You're talking about unemployment rates trebling in this, in, in the course of just two months. What is it? What is that going to mean? Mm -hmm. um, like this, that already is going to mean that a whole bunch of people aren't going to have money. So if you're, if, if you're running a business, you've got to think very strongly about where you're positioned because you've got to be the thing that matters for people mm. because everything that's in the middle is going to get squished. So it's going to be cheap stuff and high quality purpose brand stuff, but the middle is going to, is going to really suffer like tremendously after this. Yeah. I mean, I talking to some of our brands, big and small, I mean, the one thing that is coming as a theme is about the interconnectivity of it all. So obviously there are brands there with like zillions of pounds in stock that they can't sell. Uh, orders are being cancelled um, so the whole supply chain is being is, is suffering so i mean in the beginning of the year you project growth of you know three x's two x's whatever it is and then you are now in a position in which you cannot actually even dream of achieving those numbers but you have built an infrastructure uh, of teams that helps you deliver to that but actually, when you look at your forecast for or your refocus for bottom line, it's actually telling you that you will be the same um, kind of growth levels that maybe 10 years ago. And this is real stories that we're hearing from brands. So I think brands will have to make incredibly tough decisions. And I think people, individuals, um, we have to find a way to reinvent our outlook on all of these and, and look at how we can actually think about this differently because the repercussions is like we going, we are rolling back time probably 10 years ago. 
uh, yeah. from an economic contraction point. So at the moment, I, I have to admit, I was quite severe in my thinking, uh, probably until three weeks ago. And now I'm very humble because uh, I had first have have first had conversations with brand owners, with suppliers, with retailers, and the scale, it's unbelievably overwhelming. So I agree with you that honesty and authenticity and vulnerability is important. And, and I think we need to help each other as much as we possibly can and, and give tips and, and so on and to how to progress and navigate. Because I think the only word that comes sticks to my mind is this word of togetherness. And it's not about my team or me or whatever it's we let's do it together it doesn't really matter levels of seniority um, it's affected everyone right so there's nobody <laughs> that hasn't isn't being affected no usual from that perspective okay i've got some questions and uh, what do you suggest businesses do to engage with their clients more um what one thing um that will help you engage well you, uh, we have to be responsible. So we were talking about togetherness just now. I, I also wanted just to add, and this is linked to your question, Diana, is responsibility. Mm -hmm. So um, you can feed off everyone's fears. Uh, and I don't think long term, that's not feasible for a lot of businesses to survive. Um, I, you know, if you look at the Daily Mail, I hate to bring the Daily Mail up. But um, if you go on the Daily Mail, anytime during COVID, you'll see in bold, 709 dead. First thing you'll see, taking up half of the whole page. And they know that algorithmically, uh, human beings respond, whether we like it or not, to things that bring on anxiety. And that in result um, will help with the advertising dollars because they're getting a lot of clicks. It's clickbait, whether we like it or not. Mm. And, and, and that's a business model that works for them. But they have the scale to do that. For startups or small businesses that are just getting going during COVID, I think it's all about trench warfare as well in terms of understanding, okay, how can I bootstrap this business? Um, not so that the quality of what we're offering is jeopardized, but so it's run in a way that can be affordable. What is, how can I trim down the burn rate of the business? Um, so it can still be keep going, but they can survive for the next six months so we can figure out what the hell we're doing. Um, and I think it's, it's that, it's, you know, everyone needs to think a little bit smaller in terms of how the business, the innards of the business will run so it can survive because the government loans that everyone's talking about, <laughs> I don't know if you've, you've heard from friends, but, but from what I'm hearing, very few are being given out at any real pace that can help businesses. So you really need to just think of a bootstrap mentality for the next six months. That's my view on it. That's certainly how um, our board and the investors and the people that we're working with, what we see is how we can, we can you know, churn, reduce the churn, but still deliver the same quality of, of service to, to the consumer base. Thank I, think, you. Oh. I think sort of coming back to that in terms of engaging with clients and somebody else, I think later writes about how, how do you bring vulnerability into it? I think, I think, you can engage with your clients by saying, and I think it's okay to say, these are the things that we're doing, and this mm -hmm. is how we're looking after the people in our organ organization first. Mm -hmm. And so like, I, think you can, I think you can be upfront about that and saying, right, you know, we understand it's a difficult time. Here's what we're trying to do about it. So you know, already you see some brands who are like the likes of Burberry, et cetera, have been um, reassigning some of their supply chain to, be, to making PPE, right? So, which which is great so it, and it, it it sort of doesn't even matter how much they make in terms of is it a drop in the ocean across need the fact is that they're doing it and they feel that they should do it and it's right to do and i think those you can make those messages you can talk about this is what we're doing about staff maintaining them this is we're, we're here for you you know we're, we're, these are these are the ways in which you can connect with us if you're not about buying stuff now we we understand that and he, he, here's here's more, more information about what we do and how we do it you can start to generate those stories and I, th I think that's okay hmm. because and like to, to, to miss Anne's point it's like so many people are going to be struggling and off the back of you know in terms of the loans given out it's 1.4 percent of applications mm. it's rubbish like yeah and I think it's also 
if I can just add one quick thing, it's also an opportunity for the brands and corporate companies to ask their customers how they're doing, yeah. right? And it, this may not be the time to talk all about you, but give them a mouthpiece, give them an opportunity to share their fears or their concerns or their hopes and dreams and listen. Uh, and when you hear they're saying, you can be putting that into future use for where your company is going. Yeah. Hmm. And that is I mean, really important. That, I think that's massively important. I think so. there are so many brands who, who have a view of who their customer are. And when you talk to them, you say, you think your customer is that? That's not what I see when, when I see people wearing your clothes. That, that's not your customer. No. So I think, yeah, absolutely. Re reconnecting with who are you? And like, what do you want? And like, what do you need? And what do you care about is prime. May I ask, we kind of, I mean, I can talk to you all day pretty much, but we are kind of running out of time. In the bottom of your screens, you have a QA and a um, box. And if you can answer the questions, um, uh, the three of you will be much appreciated. So uh, if you click the Q&A, you can see, so everybody actually can, can see that the questions has been answered. Um, and if you can mute your microphones and stay on, online, uh, answering the questions will be much appreciated. I just want to say thank you um, for taking the time, for sharing your thoughts, for your optimism. And uh, yeah, um, just thank you so much for, for being here. So um, uh, thank you also for sharing the, the, the questions. Over to Claudia. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Misan. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, thank you, Tom, for sharing your knowledge with us today and your opinion. Thank you all for joining. So we have a question for next week, and I will answer this question. Next week, we'll have two webinars, one on Wednesday for Earth Day, uh, and we'll be discussing the power of circularity with four special guests at 2 p.m. So Wednesday, the 22nd of April at 2 p.m., the power of circularity. And on Friday, we'll have another webinar. We'll be discussing the um, how businesses can plan for success, uh, both during and after the pandemic, with Ray Newton-Smith, uh, the chief economist at the CBI. Um, and it will be on Friday, 10 a.m. Um, 10 a.m., yes. Uh, you can sign up to our newsletter now to reserve your spot. Uh, and if you have any questions, just email us at uh, marketing at positiveluxury.com. We are more than happy to answer your question. Uh, stay safe. Thank you all for joining.